I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, and this is Ground Game. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among one of the most consequential stories ever covered by the Associated Press in its 170-year history. Here to take you inside the outbreak is AP's Ralph Russo. From the Associated Press, this is Inside the Outbreak. I'm Ralph Russo. Today is Thursday, April 30th. In Europe, over 132,000 people with coronavirus have died so far. Fears about new infection spikes were tempering hopes that economies will start bouncing back as businesses begin to reopen. New unemployment figures covering the countries that use the euro show massive job protection programs are temporarily keeping millions on payrolls. That's helped spare Europeans some of the record-setting layoffs battering Americans. Another 3.8 million Americans filed for jobless benefits last week, pushing the total number toward 30 million. On this episode of Inside the Outbreak, we'll take a look at how France and Spain are cautiously trying to reopen their economies. We'll catch up with AP's Aritz Para in Spain and Angela Charlton in France. What strategies are being used to bring life back to normal in two of the countries hit hardest by COVID-19? Aritz Para is an AP reporter based in Spain. Angela Charlton is an AP reporter in France. Thank you both for joining me today. Let's start with Angela in France, where there have been almost 24,000 deaths from COVID-19. Why now and what are steps being taken there to reopen society? France was one of the hardest hit countries, which was a real shock for a place that is considered to have one of the world's best public health systems. But by now, the number of people in intensive care has been dropping for about three weeks, along with the number of new daily deaths and the number of new daily infections. And meanwhile, the economy, which is the number six economy in the world and an engine for the whole European Union, is tanking. So the government decided it's time to start opening things up. Like a lot of places, they're doing it cautiously with a sort of multi-stage approach. So their first stage comes May 11th. And that's when some farmers markets, uh, most shops, hair salons, cemeteries, and a lot of schools will open again. And so for schools, they're going to start actually with the youngest kids. They'll start with daycare and preschool and primary school. And then the next phases are May 18th, when junior high schools will start opening up. And then June 2nd, when they may start opening up restaurants, hotels, and other parts of the tourism industry, which are obviously extremely important to a place like France. The whole rollout will be tied to a map of red and green zones based on how much the virus has spread in your region. Uh, So a a place like Paris that has had a lot of cases, I think will be in a red zone. Um, And then one other important thing they're starting to do is they'll start letting people move around a bit more. People over over 65 will be free to leave their houses without special pieces of paper anymore, which is not the case now. Also, right now, for example, in Paris, you're not supposed to go for more than like a half a mile from your house to go to a store or to do any sports. And starting on May 11th, you'll be able to travel for up to about 60 miles, which means you can like go take a bike ride, <laughs> but you can't travel across the country. So there'll still be a lot of limitations. Aritz, how does that compared to what's happening in Spain, why now and what are the steps being taken to get that economy back up and running? Well, um, in terms of the official death toll, I think we're we're talking about a similar level, um, around 24,000 people who have officially died from COVID-19. But uh, France has, uh, I think it's uh, 67 million inhabitants and Spain has a population of 46 million. So even with the limitations of the counting, because official figures are clearly failing to capture the scope of of the pandemic, um, and especially in Spain, the toll in nursing homes and in other places is is not emerging in those numbers. But Spain is clearly uh, one of the worst affected countries. Where we are at the moment is that the 
health system seems to have seen the worst of it. The intensive care units uh, have seen a respite lately, and at least for the moment, the focus for now is pretty much on what's the way out of a near total freeze of social and, and economic life, as you were saying. The difference with France is that Spain, rather than focusing on specific dates, what Spain is doing is setting a health, sort of like a series of health milestones that the different regions need to overcome if they want to enter a more relaxed phase in the way out of the lockdown. It's what the prime minister has called the road to a new normal something that he has said that is being carried out without the GPS system because there's there's no such thing in this pandemic. So in a very similar way, but following that sort of like milestone approach, individual exercise will be allowed from Saturday. Uh, so a lot of us will be rejoicing when we go out for our first run in, in seven weeks. Um, a lot of us will also be getting our first haircut in the next few days, um, in, in more than in in nearly two months um, and then shops will reopen uh, starting on may 11 uh, socializing uh, will be permitted in outdoor cafes and bars churches will be allowed to hold mass at one third of their capacity and then progressively uh, life will be coming back to restaurants, cinemas, theaters, museums. Barring any worsening of the outbreak, capacity in venues will be increased toward mid-June and with beaches uh, opening toward the end of June, I think that that can be declared, it will be possible to declare that that Spain is, is settling into a new normal. Angela, you talked about people moving around. What about public transportation? I know here in New York, obviously, that's a big concern. Lots of people, small, confined places. Let's start with you and what's going on in France and what their ideas might be to any type of public transportation um, opening up in the cities. Public transportation is, is quite important around French cities, including Paris. And a lot of people are wary about the idea of squeezing back into a crowded subway train to go you know, across the Seine River or wherever. So that's a big point of debate today. Transit officials started today handing out masks at train stations, and they also went into the metros to mark off seats so that no one will sit next to each other. They're also putting markings on the floors of the trains themselves and on the platforms with the you know, assumption that people will stand on these markings and stay a safe distance apart. But it's, it, you know, really remains a question whether people will actually obey that, especially when the crush of the morning commute resumes, because what's going to happen is you'll have transit officials who will have to stand at the entrance to uh, a subway station and regulate the traffic going in. And I can imagine that's going to create bottlenecks on these you know, narrow Parisian sidewalks. And I think it's going to be it's going to be a real challenge to make that work. Aritz, what does that situation look like in Spain? How much do uh, major Spanish cities rely on public transportation? Well, um, here it's, once again, it's also very similar. Um, people are a little bit wary of going back to crowded trains and buses, but um, authorities have said that they want to manage what they call both the supply uh, by increasingly adding more frequency to public transportation, but also they want to keep the demand pay and for that they are they are requesting for people to continue to work from home or they are asking companies to make the working schedule more flexible what they are saying also i mean spain has uh, two archipelagos that are actually very popular with tourists transportation to to those places with ferries um, are now being kept at very minimal level, but the, the plan is to increase gradually um, as, as things get better. Uh, regarding transportation, the main sort of like um, elephant in the room sort of issue is the air transportation. And and that's interesting. Today, I was speaking to, to a very uh, high level government official and, and she was uh, telling a few reporters that pretty much Spain is leaving for the European Union and international air safety bodies to to decide uh, how to to operate air transportation and that's something that 
it's still up in the air and uh, there's no clear roadmap about what's going to happen with that. Angela, how are people reacting to this idea of reopening and slowly getting back to normal? It's one thing for businesses to open. It's quite another for folks to start shopping. And you even said that there's some apprehension about going down into a subway. Can you get a feel for what the reaction of the people in France is to reopening? Well, the French really love to debate. So there's been a lot of back and forth on all of these issues over the last 24 hours really about what this will mean for regular people. There's There was a quick poll that suggests that a majority of people are skeptical about pretty much everything on this, this government list. I would say the, the touchiest subject is schools, and probably the second touchiest is, is public transport. Some mayors are already refusing to reopen on May 11th because they say that they can't ensure sufficient safety measures. And then Plenty of parents don't want to send their kids back because they fear it's not safe. On the other hand, some parents are relieved, particularly those who are struggling financially and depend on school lunches, for example, to help nourish their kids. But then there's the larger question of who will even be allowed to send their kids back because one of the rules says, the new rule says that daycares can only take 10 kids per group. And in primary schools, for example, class sizes will be capped at a maximum of 15, which You know, most classes here are closer to 25 or 30 or more. So, you know, who's going to get to go back? How are they going to sort this out? All this is being left to each school to sort out. And we're 12 days away. And a lot of schools are saying that that's not enough time for them to figure this out. Um, One thing they've said is that um, the priority will go to families where the parents are health workers or grocery store workers, but also to kids who are struggling in school. That's their big That's one of the big arguments the government has made for reopening the schools now instead of just closing it for the rest of the school year is that they're saying, well, these kids who are already struggling, they're just going to be so far behind that we've lost them for this year. So they're really trying to get those kids back. Are are people in Spain pushing back against the idea of opening? Uh, Are there maybe some who are saying we're not doing it quickly enough? What's that debate like in Spain? So far, the harshest criticism uh, and let's keep in mind that all these measures were announced only yesterday. So I expect much more criticism to come in, in, in the next few days. But the harshest criticism has come so far from bar, restaurant, and other business owners um, who feel that with occupancy limitations for venues, uh, they are exposed to, to losing money. So as one business leader put it this morning, if I have to face 100 and 100% costs, but I can only make 30% of revenue, I'm not going to open my shop. And and I think the way he, he was putting that, it was very emblematic of the, of the overall situation. But in terms of the average Joe, people are not really pushing back, um, or at least not. I think everybody feels relief that they're seeing a way out of this. And so far, the biggest criticism of the government has been more for locking down than than for relaxing confinement. The biggest controversy so far had been the issue of children. Spain has been one of the few countries in the world that closed the schools and ordered all the kids to stay at home without allowing them to go out, like nothing, period. So a lot of them have been at home for for nearly six weeks. So the backlash has been growing week after week, especially when some educators and especially very angry and stressed parents, <laughs> they were demanding basically to take their children out until the government finally last week yielded to pressure and allowed uh, outings in a very controlled manner. The way to do it has been, and it's been only happening for a few days, one time per day for one hour, supervised by one adult and for no more than one kilometer or roughly half a mile from their home. Aritz Para is an AP reporter based in Spain. Angela Charlton is an AP reporter in France. Thank you very much for joining me today. Really appreciate the insight. Please stay healthy, please stay safe. And maybe we'll be checking in with, again with you soon after we see how this all works out in Spain and France. Thank you, Ralph. No problem. Take care. At APNews.com, today's One Good Thing feature is about a singer. First responder or health Broadway theaters may be shut down, but stage star Brian Stokes Mitchell is still singing on Broadway. 
the avenue that is. Weeks after recovering from the coronavirus, the actor and singer opens his apartment window, which happens to be on Broadway, and each evening he serenades a growing crowd with his signature song from Man of La Mancha. You can read that story and get all of AP's coronavirus outbreak coverage at apnews.com. That's it for this episode of Ground Game. We'll be here every step of the way during this extraordinary moment in American politics and American life, giving you all the news you need to know. Be sure to tell a friend about us and please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Some of the details of our discussion may have changed by the time you hear this. For up-to-date developments on all of your news, head over to apnews.com. From the Westwood One Podcast Network.